that's involved. So, for example, if you were going to run the latest uh, you know, Windows XP and you wanted to use a particular video card, you should find out if the company who makes that video card has produced drivers for that card to run under Windows XP. If you're going to run it under Windows 2000, also you'll need to see they have drivers for that, Windows 98, ME, etc. Um, let's say for, for some reason you want to use uh, OS2 as an operating system. Um, well, good luck finding uh, a, a new video card where that company has written drivers to run that card under OS2. So the driver you know, has to work not only with the hardware, but also with the operating system. And you have to make sure that your driver matches both. So if you change operating systems or change hardware, you very likely will have to change the driver that's involved. And in almost all cases, these drivers will have to come from the company who makes the hardware. Now, a lot of times when you install some newer operating systems like Windows XP and you pop the disk in, it'll scan all of the hardware in your system and then automatically install drivers for it. How did that work? Did, did Microsoft uh, write those drivers? No, they did not. But what they did do is collect the drivers from all the hardware companies for their most popular products and build those drivers into the Windows disk so that would make the installation easier. It was in their best interest and yours to have as many drivers as they could on that Windows CD. When you do go to install it, you don't have to find all of these extra disks have drivers for the various cards and, and other things that you have. So, um, so this layer uh, box is the drivers that interface the hardware to the operating system or the software in the, in the machine. Now we're going to take a look at this uh, BIOS layer in more detail. We're going to take this layer, the BIOS, and break it up into its constituent components. We'd have, well, several. Let's look at it as the initial ROM BIOS and then also the other device drivers that you load on top of it. Move over here and to look at this motherboard and see if we can find the ROM BIOS on the motherboard. If I take a look here, I can see a lot of the you know, major components. For example, here's the processor with the heat sink attached, mounted in the processor socket. We've got slots and places to connect memory and disk drives and other things. Now, the ROM BIOS on this board happens to be right here. Let's take a, a zoom in on it right here. And you can see the chip. It has a sticker on it from AMI. Now, this is an older motherboard. Um, you know, it's not, not important how old or current it is. Is I just wanted to show you uh, a, a typical BIOS chip. Now this one's AMI, American Megatrends International. They're one of the three big BIOS manufacturers. There's Phoenix, MI, and Award. And Award was recently bought by Phoenix, so they're really the same company, although they do still market the products separately. AMI, American Megatrends International, um, has, has installed their code into this chip. Now we can look at a ROM chip from really a couple of different perspectives. We can look at the chip from by what it contains, or by actually how the chip itself works. Now we're going to do that both ways. First, let's look at the BIOS by what it contains, and then we'll look at how the actual chip works. What is in this chip? Well, I, this, you could think of this chip very much the same as you think of a floppy disk. Um, it's a storage medium. In other words, we store data in this chip. Now there's a difference between a ROM chip and a normal type of memory chip. I have an example here. Um, the, this is a uh, SIM, or single inline memory module, with r you know, standard RAM chips on it. What's the difference between these RAM chips and this ROM chip? Now, of course, obviously, RAM stands random access memory. But you know what's interesting is that ROM is also randomly accessible. So actually, the term you know, RAM and ROM kind of being thought of as, as opposites is, is really not, not technically correct. Um, all ROM is also RAM. It's randomly addressable. But normally when we say RAM, we don't mean RAM. We mean this specific type of memory here. What would be the main difference between these two types of chips? Well, one is read-only, the other one is not. That's true, but that to me is not the main difference. The main difference can be expressed in one word, volatility. RAM is volatile. ROM is non-volatile. Now, what does it mean when something is volatile or non-volatile? Well, when you cut the power to the board, Volatile memory loses data. Non-volatile memory will retain that information. This ROM chip, in other words, has data stored in it, which even though it was originally programmed or, you know, back in 1993, the data is still there. And this board hasn't been powered up for you know, almost 10 years. Um, the RAM here will maintain data for only about 15 milliseconds after the 
power is removed. Any longer than 15 milliseconds and all that data is gone. So volatility is really the key difference between RAM and ROM. Now some people have, you know, when, it, when I've pointed this out, they'll look over to, to this component here, which is the battery, and they'll say, well, right, the, the ROM is able to maintain data without power because it has an auxiliary power source, this battery. Well, it's true that almost all PC motherboards do contain a battery, but it is not for the motherboard ROM. There is, in fact, absolutely no connection between this ROM chip and this battery on this board. No, I could remove this ROM chip from the board, and it will still retain data indefinitely. I mean, millions of years, or as long as that should survive, the data will be maintained. It is truly non-volatile. No, that battery is there for something else, which we will go into in just a little bit. So, uh, we now know the difference between what we call a ROM chip and a RAM chip. Now, now let's take a look at more what's in this uh, ROM. Well, basically there are four things contained in the board ROM. Let's start the first thing. What, ha what happens when you turn a PC on? What's the first thing it does? It does something we call the POST, which stands for Power On Self-Test. What is the POST? It's a series of tests that test components on the motherboard, test the memory, test the disk drives, and all of the major operating components in the PC before it will boot up. Now, in fact, these POST diagnostics, Power On Self-Test internal diagnostics, have been very useful in troubleshooting problems. In fact, I recently had a system which uh, would lock up, you know, seconds after you turned it on. But we watched as the post test were being listed on the screen, and it stopped right after a particular line was displayed. Well, what we did was we went to another system, which was identical, and saw what would be the next line that would be displayed, and it was testing the level 2 cache in the system. So by virtue of that, we were able to determine that the L2 cache was what had failed. In other words, when it had tried to test it, it locked the system up. And by replacing that cache, we now restored the system to oper operation. So it was, uh, it was nice. This sort of built-in diagnostics really did all the work for us as far as helping us figure out what was wrong. So what, what happens after the post? Well, normally after the post, the system will beep, and then the floppy drive or the CD-ROM drive or the hard drive will light up. What's going on at that point is a, a, a process we call the bootstrap loader. That's the, the second set of routine in the uh, motherboard ROM chip. The bootstrap loader's job is to locate a boot sector, load it in, and execute it. Now, some people say the bootstrap loader is supposed to load the operating system. Well, not exactly. All the bootstrap loader routine does is load a single sector off of a bootable drive, and then that sector loads another boot sector, which then loads the core or kernel files from the operating system. Sometimes they're also called system files. So it's really kind of a chain of events, things that get loaded as the system boots up. But certainly, the bootstrap loaded here start that process off by loading this boot sector. Normally, what it would be is what we call the master boot sector on the hard disk. So the routines in here locate that master boot sector, load it into memory, into RAM, and then run this, the program that's contained within it. Then, what happens after your operating system is loaded? Well, after the operating system is loaded, there are drivers inside this motherboard ROM which can handle various components in the system. For example, in that motherboard ROM, there's a keyboard driver. There uh, is a basic hard disk driver. There's a floppy disk driver. There 